All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. For those of you who might be new to the Bipartisan Policy Center, um, the ability to engage proud partisans and individuals with strongly held and disparate interests in a constructive manner is very core to our mission and influence. A fierce and open democracy depends upon free and open exchange of ideas. We look to our colleges and universities to instill the skills of formulating a thoughtful viewpoint, listening carefully to others, disagreeing respectfully, and identifying opportunities for pragmatic consensus. Graduates need these civic skills to be the next generation of leaders who can heal our polarized politics. However, too often today, colleges and universities do not maintain a robust culture of free expression. And the president has just put issues at the forefront of higher education policy debates with Thursday's executive order on campus free speech. The moral and intellectual habits acquired during college years last a lifetime. What happens on a college, camp on a college experience does not stay on campus. When students graduate without practice and free, open, and respectful exchange, they're not prepared to be the leaders our country is going to need. That is why we are launching the Campus Free Expression Initiative. Well beyond the headline-grabbing protests with violence and threats of violence on a few campuses, we will be concerned with the deeper crisis of free expression that arises from a campus, cli cli a campus climate where students and faculty too feel the need to self-censor, the lack of intellectual diversity on many college faculties, the shutting down of speakers and debate, which in addition to the most notorious examples that we've all heard of involving conservative provocateurs have disrupted speakers across the political spectrum, including when California Attorney General, a Democrat, was subjected to a heckler's veto at a private liberal arts college. The Campus Free Expression Project will establish an active coalition of university leaders and policymakers to promote campus policies and programs that foster free expression and provide students with the essential civil skills needed to engage in free, open, and respectful exchange. Jackie Pfeffer Merrill, who spent 11 years as a college professor, first at the College of William and Mary, and then St. John's College, directs our new project and will moderate the panel. Take it away. All right, thank you, Michelle. And thanks all very much to all of you who are here today to join us for this uh, panel. I think we're going to have a, a terrific, lively discussion. You do all have the bios of our speakers, so I'll just introduce them very briefly and, and get right into our conversations. Uh, Eric Fingerhood is CEO and president of Hillel International. He represented Ohio's 19th district in the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives. He was an Ohio state senator, and he was the person in charge of Ohio's public university system as, as uh, regent of, or chancellor of the Ohio Board of Regents, a system that includes uh, more than a dozen colleges, or private, uni or sorry, public. public universities, and uh, almost two dozen community colleges. Steve Hayward is a, a fellow at the University of California's Berkeley's Institute for Government Studies, a fellow here at BPC, and he was the inaugural uh, occupant of the chair in conservative thought at the University of Colorado Boulder. Before he returned to campuses, hmm. uh, he had a long career at think tanks here in Washington, D.C., including more than a decade at the American Enterprise Institute. And Sandy Unger is president emeritus of Goucher College, and he leads the uh, free speech project at Georgetown University. Before he uh, was on campus again, he too had another career, this, in this case as a journalist. He had, a, uh, was, had roles at the Washington Post, directed Voice of America, and uh, was a host of All Things Considered, one of my very favorite shows. Um, so the, the very title of, of today's uh, uh, panel, The Crisis of Free Expression on Campus, makes an assumption that there is a crisis of free expression on college campuses. And not everyone shares that assumption. I was uh, at a panel last week where I heard a presentation from a distinguished scholar whose work I respect who asserted that there isn't such a crisis. And in response to the president's executive order, I read uh, the head of another higher ed organization here in town assert that this is a solution in search of a problem. Um, so just bracketing the, for the moment the president's uh, executive order I do want to start with a question, you know, is there a crisis? And if so, in what does it consist? And I, I know that in this audience here, there's going to be people who have a wide range of, of views on that. 
Sandy, would you start us off? Sure, uh, Jackie, thanks. I'm glad to be here and, and uh, very supportive of the project you're starting up and I think it's nice for us to be able to help you launch it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a crisis, but it's not the crisis that most people are describing. Uh, it's a crisis that goes across the political spectrum. The challenges to free speech that get the most attention are the challenges to certain dramatic speakers who are more I would say more in the category of circus clowns than conservative thinkers. And, it, but it's been very, they've had good business and it's been very profitable for some of them to go around, be prevented from speaking and uh, have hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on campus security as, as a real result of their very presence. I think eventually somebody will get the idea that maybe inviting them does not promote uh, serious intellectual dialogue. Uh, of course, there are deplorable instances of speakers being shouted down. I'm certainly not in favor of that, of serious speakers being shouted down. But there are also uh, uh, moments, and quite a few of them actually, when liberal thought is also suppressed on campuses or when literally free speech is suppressed. One of, uh, one of the things we do in the Free Speech Project at Georgetown with the funding of the Knight Foundation and the Mellon Foundation uh, so far, others to come, uh, is to document instances where free speech has been compromised across the political spectrum. And one of the ones that is most shocking, and there are several like it, is when somebody makes a public speech on a college campus and criticizes Donald Trump openly, and cell phone videos capture it, and soon go viral and soon appear on a certain television network, the people who have criticized the president are not just shut down, they often have death threats, they have to cancel other speeches because the president's posse is out there to try to prevent negative talk about him. That is a very serious threat to free speech. It's not what he's talking about, clearly, when he issues an executive order, and I wrote about this in the Washington Post recently, but it's a very serious problem. So there is a problem across the political spectrum, and I think there are, it's a great challenge for us in these difficult times to try to figure out some solutions for it, but I think there are some. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Steve. I'm never sure if I like crisis language for <laughs> anything, except something that's really acute, like a hurricane wiping <laughs> out a city or something. Uh, but to the extent that we can use this language in higher education, I think there's two things that come to mind. Uh, one is, but they're more slow moving, but still they're becoming more severe. So to the extent that they're all going in one direction, I think there's a bit of a crisis. So one of the ones that interests me, and it's because of our shared interest in the social sciences and humanities, is that they're slowly dying. Not everywhere, not at uniform rates, but the number of students majoring in history, English literature, a lot of the social sciences are declining. At some universities, not, it's not uniform, some are thriving, but at some universities you're starting to see social sciences and humanities retire tenure line professorships when someone finally retires and reapportion that to something in STEM. I think universities are slowly separating into de facto two universities. The STEM fields, because that's where the jobs are, uh, and the humanities and social sciences, which are going to be kind of left to wither and die and be politicized cesspools. Mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. one part of it. I think the second thing is, um, it seems to me that the campus climate, which has been I liberal for decades. I was with you until you used that term. What, cesspools? Steve, yes. <laughs> we can discriminate about some of that. Um, look, I'm in that. Look, I'm, I will say I'm an inmate at Berkeley. I hang out with all, right? Um, the uh, second part is, um, it seems to me that the, the campus atmosphere is always tilted left. That goes back decades. And conservatives have been complaining about it since at least the 1930s that I've noticed in between background reading on it. Um, but it seems to me the censorious of, censoriousness of the left on campus has intensified. Uh, a couple of ways to describe this. I can give you some case studies, including some recent ones out of Berkeley. Uh, but I'll put it this way. I think it was back in 1989 or 90 when it was either Newsweek or Time, I forget which, had their cover on shh. The thought police are listening. It was all about what then we called the crisis of political correctness. And I remember thinking at the time, and a lot of people thought at the time, well, surely this can't go on like this for very long. And most of the things that they were pointing out then and was part of the conversation are now, I notice, federal law. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, certain state law in California in certain mm -hmm. respects. I can, you know, we mocked Antioch College, which has no longer exists, right, for their uh, 
the whole steps you had to do for sexual consent at a romantic encounter, that's now state law in California mm -hmm. for all universities, passed by the legislature and signed by Governor Brown. How this works in practice? You really gonna have a GoPro camera going when you're out on a date? I don't think so, but, but that's where we are. That's sort of a more frothy thing. But uh, one other quick example is um, the student senate at Berkeley recently put up a resolution, just a resolution, there's no campus policy involved, to deplore the changes proposed by President Trump to Title IX. Changes, by the way, approved by a large number of the faculty at Harvard Law School. Uh, one member of the student senate, a young lady who is an evangelical Christian, abstained, didn't vote no, but abstained, but committed the sin of saying she thought marriage should be between a man and a woman because she's an evangelical Christian. Immediately the cry rose up, editorial the Daily Cal, she must be expelled from the student senate. The Daily Cal would not print her, uh, an op-ed that she wrote defending her side of the story. Uh, I reached out to her, I didn't, didn't know her, but I reached out to her and she said she only heard from two faculty, me and one other, and nobody from the administration, and sort of hung out to dry. And that's sort of a climate of, as I say, moral censoriousness that has, uh, I think, gotten worse and continues to get worse. Hmm. Eric. Uh, well, first of all, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me and to be with this distinguished panel. Uh, I'm, I need to just add one additional context to, my, uh, to the bio that you read so that uh, everybody in the, in the audience and those listening understand the perspective that I bring to this today. Uh, first of all, you, you mentioned that I had the privilege of serving as a state legislator in Ohio for 10 years and a member of the U.S. Congress. I'm a Democrat, uh, so that uh, people should know that uh, in terms of the context that, that I bring to this. Uh, uh, as well, I served under a Democratic governor as chancellor of the uh, Board of Regents of Ohio and a bipartisan legislature. Uh, so I find myself surprised to come here and say that, yes, indeed, I think there is a crisis. And the reason, the reason I say that is the result of my current role. Uh, for those who don't know what Hillel is, Hillel is the largest and oldest uh, Jewish student organization on campus for 95 years. Uh, uh, it's been our role to provide Jewish life on campus, support Jewish life for students. So we're part of the religious uh, communities uh, on campus. We work closely, obviously, with chaplaincies and with, uh, and with student affairs and residential life and all of the, all of the non-academic uh, uh, portions uh, of, of the university life. Um, and uh, I have to say that I did not expect that in the time that I've served in this position, the amount of time that I would be spending uh, dealing with university administrators about the problem of their campus climate, especially so because every university brochure has some page or phrase or paragraph promising and encouraging diversity uh, and welcoming of different, uh, of, of, of all identities uh, and certainly those of, uh, uh, of religious faiths. So there's a, there's a practical, there, there's a piece of this that I think is relatively easy that I think the, the uh, higher education community can and should address quickly, and then there's a part that's much more difficult. The, the part that's, e that's relatively easy uh, is, uh, uh, Sanford mentioned, the shouting down of speakers. Um, and I want to say that while uh, I think you used the phrase circus clowns, uh, while there certainly are some of those who are invited solely to be provocative, and we all know, we all know that's the case, that this extends beyond the circus clowns. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, our Hillel at San Francisco State University invited the mayor of Jerusalem, who was on a tour uh, of, um, uh, of California, visiting Silicon Valley, et cetera. Um, and we knew, given the, the climate on that campus, that that would be a, uh, a controversial, that there would be pro likely be protesters. We worked with the university administration, with the police, et cetera, uh, to, be, uh, to be prepared. And yet, the university allowed that, uh, it, that, that event to be so disrupted that it was dangerous and ultimately was shut down. When was that, Eric? It, I'm sorry? When, when, what year this was that? This was about two years ago, about two years ago, quite recently. Um, and, uh, and we were told at the time that the protesters were exercising their free speech. So this is something that ought to be able to be taught and trained and, you know, and, and, and cleared up. Uh, and, and cleared up relatively quickly. Uh, a, a second one that I think is relatively easy is that uh, we enjoy not only freedom of speech on campus as, a, uh, as individuals and as citizens, we also enjoy a freedom of association. We are an association that has the right to choose with whom we choose to associate, what programs we want to partner with, what speakers we want to welcome. Um, and, uh, and we're quite frequently uh, under attack 
for choosing not to associate with, uh, with uh, uh, individuals or speakers that, uh, that, uh, that do not uh, share the philosophy we, we bring to the campus. So again, I think those things are easier. I think the harder one, uh, Jackie, if I could maybe tee up something for the discussion, um, is that the title of this panel includes not only freedom of expression, but also ideological diversity. And I think the challenge of ideological, ideological diversity is, uh, is, particularly, uh, is particularly challenging for the students and the organizations that I represent. Um, so uh, I think that it's, uh, it's relatively well known that, uh, that the uh, Jewish students and, and the, the Jewish uh, tradition uh, consists both of a faith tradition, uh, but also of a nationality, of also of a peoplehood tradition. Uh, as long as the biblical times, that, that uh, peoplehood tradition has been also associated with a homeland, uh, with the idea of a Jewish homeland. In modern terms, that's the political ideology of Zionism. Modern Zionism dates back to the 19th century. It's a political ideology that uh, you know, uh, great thinkers like Herzl and Ben-Gurion and Chada Am and others uh, have taught. It was embraced by the British government in the Balfour Declaration in the early 20th century by President Wilson and every president since then, the American government. And yet there are college campuses um, where the, and, and I, I would say we entirely appreciate that this is something that should be critiqued, that should be studied, that should be analyzed, that should be argued with, uh, but there are college campuses today that are so comprehensively uh, uh, on one side of the question that Zionism is, uh, uh, is, a, is an ideology that should be banned or should be, uh, or should be defeated, that the impact on Jewish students on campus is that they are intimidated from, uh, from, um, uh, from expressing uh, their points of view we have had instances like what Stephen mentioned where Jewish students have been excluded from student government or from committees, uh, uh, other projects, because they've traveled to Israel or they've been to Israel. Uh, and so I think it's important for, and I, I look forward to learning from my fellow panelists, it's important to understand the extent to which uh, lack of intellectual diversity, ideological diversity on campus, can result uh, in a stifling, a censoriousness, to use Stephen's word, uh, of student behavior, which directly impacts their ability to fully engage in the life of a university. Hmm. Well, I mean, I think this question of intellectual diversity is, is an important one for the, for the broad question uh, of free expression. I mean, we're not just the, I apply the, the title of the Free Speech Project, but we are trying to take on here at BBC this self-centering and the freedom of association questions, too. When one thinks about intellectual diversity, I mean, some people would say in response, well, sure, there are a few people, a few college professors on the right and on the left and of all kinds of other views who say, who try to use the classroom as, a, as an opportunity to propagandize and, or to convince students of a certain point of view and genuinely make certain views objectionable or unwelcome in their classrooms. But you know, speaking as a former college professor, I always try to give faculty the benefit of the doubt. And they are, I think most faculty and, and most administrators will say, we want to have assignments from different readers, thinkers of different sorts. A faculty member is charged with articulating all points of view in his classroom and, and fostering debate. So I mean, why is it that we have to have an intellectually diverse faculty and, and, and leadership at the, at the college? I mean, why, why is that so important? Well, of course it's important because mm -hmm. this is the place where we're shaping and, and uh, developing the leaders of the future at colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. And it's quite important. I, I think um, there's often a mistake made that somehow one can, I, 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 as you mentioned, I was president of a small liberal arts college for 13 years. And there's this notion that somehow there are powerful administrators mm -hmm. who can <laughs> somehow tell faculty members that they should be more diverse in their approaches to, to problems. Um, and that is not simply not true. I mean, there's a reason for the doctrine of academic freedom. There were periods in not so distant American history when, for example, under Joseph McCarthy and his helper Roy Cohn, among others, <laughs> um, where they you know, brought intellectuals before a Senate committee and browbeat them 
to examine their points of view. And if academic freedom wasn't strong before that, it certainly had to become strong after it. Now, I think sometimes academic freedom is confused with free speech. I think they are mm -hmm. different concepts and, and uh, have to be, we have to be subtle and sophisticated about how we handle that. But I, you know, um, I always, when, I, I agree that there is a lack of intellectual diversity, certainly political diversity, on many, if not most, college campuses. But the question is how to deal with it. And this notion that somehow <clears throat> you could put out a job description saying, we want to hire a conservative chemist or, mm. <laughs> or uh, a, a free enterprise literature scholar or, 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 or you know, what have you, mm -hmm. is totally ridiculous, of course. Because, and, and I always want to know, well, what's the litmus test? Who's going to decide who's conservative enough or liberal enough? And I mean, I have dealt with this on the firing line with search, <coughs> excuse me, search committees, hiring committees, in departments of a small college where, you know, you can't get away with anything in a small college. Everybody knows everybody, everyone, uh, and and so it is complicated. And I think so. I think the approaches that have to be taken are much more subtle. I think for one thing, and I don't want to be just referring to my own experience, but when I was president of Goucher College, I made a commitment to bring in a lot of prominent speakers uh, across a range of political points of view. And that was a gamble sometimes, and there were shockingly faculty members who objected more than students yep. objected, mm -hmm. in some cases, mm -hmm. and I told the faculty members they didn't have to attend <laughs> if, they, if they weren't pleased with some of the speakers. Um, but we made, we, we made a lot of progress. And by the way, we had one of the strongest Hillels in the country at Goucher College. Wonderful Hillel well. there. Thank you for your support. And, uh, and we attempted to encourage very open discussion in the context of that Hillel and other student organizations that might have had different points of view. Some of this is easier to do in a small college. It's both harder and easier to do in a small college than in a than in a big university. So I think if, if we're serious about trying to make gradual change, and all change can only be gradual in most things, then we have to have, try to abandon name calling and try to abandon baiting of, of other people and, and laying down a challenge and, and, and try to encourage, set an example of civil discourse and of, uh, and, and I think that's, the way to do it, rather than telling one group of people to stop being so bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I liked about that story that one does hear sometimes is the faculty who protest uh, even more than some of the students. But the students these days get a, a lot of blame. Uh, you know, at the end of the year, there's all all these lists of word, words, the ten, top ten words of the year. Uh, in a recent year, 2016. One of the top ten words of the year on one of these lists was snowflake generation. Uh, oh, yeah. So ridiculous. And uh, this, you know, the students get blamed for a lot of it. And I, I want to know, and of course, it's very complicated and nuanced, and there's lots of sources of this problem. But when one thinks about it, what is, whether the students, the, the faculty, the, the general very polarized climate in which we find ourselves today, wh where is this coming to campus? Mm. Um, see, I, I don't like that term snowflake. I, I don't. don't I think it. it's but ridiculous. This, this term. pains me to be agreeing with you so much, though, Sam. I know we're <laughs> going to have to find <laughs> some things to shout at. Well, each other. okay. I'll, I'll bet I can figure. I bet I can find some. It's, it's a slur on students. It is. Um, but, but again, like free speech and certain other things, it's what's below the waterline is much more important. So mm -hmm. one thing that alarms me is that the there's an attack on the idea of free speech itself now, not just whether hate speech can be rendered an intelligible legal category uh, and made a, you know, a constitutional issue. But uh, what I've noticed and been looking at a lot is these twin attacks on free speech, one theoretical, one empirical. The theoretical one comes from you know, postmodern linguistic analysis that speech itself is a tool of power, right? And what always amazes me about this is this is thought to be a blindingly original insight of the last 20 or 30 or 40 years from various <laughs> French linguists that you can't understand. In fact, that argument is in Plato's Phaedrus and mm -hmm. uh, the Gorgias. 
exact same argument in substance, but nobody really reads those documents anymore with great care or ponders Socrates' refutation of them. Maybe we might want to do that, right? Mm -hmm. OK, that's one part. If you're not a theoretical inclined person, you sort of scratch your head at all that. The empirical one more recently is, oh, and so by the way, the conclusion is John Stuart Mill was wrong about free speech. I've had faculty and students at Berkeley say that directly. And that's why the First Amendment should be thrown out. The empirical one is completely opposite. It accepts entirely the old liberal principle that you, the only time you can limit speech is if it's physically harmful. You know, physically, I'm going to, you know, right? The old Holmes notion that my right to swing my arm ends where your nose begins. Uh, and there have been some articles about this. And the argument is that you know, somebody like Milo or a hate speaker or whoever causes physical stress. And you go through all the measures of physiology. And that's certainly true to a certain extent. We know that stress is bad for your health. Uh, is, uh, on the other hand, um, a lot of thoughts on this. One is, is having Milo speak down the street more stressful than, oh, I don't know, your midterm exam <laughs> for students? Um, I think I go through this at some length. I think the social science on this is a little dodgy. There's certain implications of it that are problematic. But above all, I think it risks creating what I call an intellectual autoimmune disorder among the current generation of students. And <laughs> that's what helps perpetuate what we describe when we use that odious term, snowflake. How is that a good enough provocation for you? <laughs> yeah. OK, good. I think, I think the midterm exam is more important than Milo, <laughs> yes. than Milo Yiannopoulos speaking down the block. Um, I don't think he's getting so many invitations anymore because yeah. people are waking up to the yeah. fact that this was a good business that didn't promote right. real dialogue. But um, yes, I think, I think that's right. I, I just think that um, there are simpler easier solutions if we abandon the cliches and the stereotypes and the name calling. Um, you know, one of the things a lot of people have gotten a lot of mileage out of the debate over so-called trigger warnings. Yeah. There's nothing new about faculty members or parents or uh, community leaders Warning, I mean, uh, on, on, and it doesn't just have to be on the much maligned NPR, on any radio or television <laughs> program, people may say some of the things that we're about to discuss may be troubling to children. And, and uh, this, was, this has been done for time immemorial. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I don't, I just have never, haven't understood why somebody's taken this and turned it into you know, a, a threat as big as the floods in the Midwest or something. Mm -hmm. Eric, uh, I think yeah. you're trying to get in Yeah, here. well, first of all, yeah. I, there's something we all agree on, which is we hate the term snowflakes. I think <laughs> this is, uh, you know, the students that I work with are intellectually strong and curious. And in fact, um, they are uh, much more interested in dialogue and hearing from both sides of an issue. Um, than often the uh, administrators and, uh, and others that, uh, that, that we work with. And, and I also just, uh, Jackie, in, in your, uh, you rose to the defense of the faculty. It, it, I, I certainly didn't be, intend to, be, to have been accusing uh, faculty. I, I, I tried to deliberately put this, this problem of, uh, of, of intellectual diversity in the context of a tough problem, not an easy problem to address or an easy problem to solve. Um, and. Uh, and I, and I think, Sanford, you mentioned that as president, you went out of your way to invite, uh, to invite different speakers to campus. Uh, we all understand how faculties are formed, how they're appointed, how they're created. We understand academic freedom. The, 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 the point that I am making, based on my actual practical hands-on experience of working with students uh, every day these last few years, is that, that we have to be attentive to the fact that when, on a particular issue, especially one that affects the identity of, uh, uh, of, of a group of students. S Stephen, you mentioned uh, another faith issue. Yeah. Um, it often, by the way, intersects with faith. And let's not forget that freedom of expression is in the same amendment to the Constitution that, uh, that uh, freedom right. of, uh, of religious belief finds its, you know, finds its root. These issues often, uh, often coincide. That we have to be attentive that if, as a result of the natural academic processes of university, uh, we find ourselves in a, in, a, in a position where what is, in the world, a very uh, established uh, idea and uh, intellectual uh, strain of thought is not being represented 
uh, on the campus, that we should make efforts to make sure that it is represented um, and that the full uh, and that the full debate is heard. I, I don't know much about the the, the, the seat you hold in cons <laughs> you held in conservative right. thought. It sounds like it's that was got to be unique in the world. It sounds yeah. like that was probably an attempt to do something similar to what I'm describing. It doesn't have to be an academic position. Uh, it can be speakers. It can be programming. It can be think conversations would, and other think things. Think what would happen if there were a chair in socialist thought someplace. If it were called well, you don't really need many of those because you have so many. Others. <laughs> well, but just, but just, just, yeah. just think of it. What would, what, what the warnings would be and what the, the there's, there's something, uh, certain vocabulary words are more acceptable than others and that's not just to the left. Mm -hmm. mm. It's to the right as well. I mean, I think it's wonderful that you held a chair in conservative thought. I did it. I just say a word about that. I actually did it with great reluctance because I the idea is dubious in a lot of ways. Well, that implies that you, what you're going to say is totally predictable, and I hope it's not. And I, yeah, I already well, have seen this morning that it's not. Actually. <laughs> um, I, 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 we maybe talk about this over lunch. I don't want to belabor it here, but I took it with great reluctance. But I did it in part because they really didn't know quite what they were doing. <laughs> and I thought someone needed to help sort it. No, that's they didn't a know very what they were dangerous get. kind of job to take. Well, uh -huh. that's I thought somebody needs to try it and sort it out and make I it agree. sensible, and I can go through all that. And it, by the way, it's thriving. Uh, they're now they're actually about to hire someone permanently. They've asked me to think about it. They've raised eighteen million dollars for their Center for Western Civilization there. Well, that now mm -hmm. that's something different. Center yep. for Western Civilization, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Not all not all thought about Western civilization is necessarily yes. conservative. I totally agree with that. Right. Uh, and uh, okay, because that's a longer story. The, the broader <laughs> problem that we brought up before, though, is mm -hmm. um, actually I do this thought experiment. Uh, there's a sort of a chicken and egg or supply problem. Um, when a conservative undergraduate comes to me and says, "Gosh, I'm so interested in whatever subject you're interested in in the humanities," should I go to? I'm thinking I want to go to graduate school, and I hesitate for a long time, in part for general reasons. The market is oversupplied anyway, right? And then second, the ideological problem may be overstated, but it is there, I think. So I hesitate a lot. And so we don't show up, part of what I'm saying. So put it this we way. We don't show up. Who? Conservatives oh. don't show up. So, well, put it this way. If the top 200 universities, whoever you describe them to be, say, we want to hire a conservative, uh, they'd run out after about 50. Or they'd be poaching from other universities, leading to no net increase in a sort of conservative But what does presence. that mean, we want to hire a conservative? What, what, what's the list? that uh, this is so hard to imagine happening in, mm -hmm. in practical day-to-day -day well, life. I can give you one example. Sure. Um, I mean, uh, here we probably should, again, make a nod to the yeah. old John Stuart Mill line about a person who only knows his side of the case doesn't right. even know I that. Totally agree. Right. If only Mill had written in simpler sentences, he'd be all the <laughs> right. rage. Yeah. Well, I make a point uh, whenever I go around and talk to economic students to find out who's on their reading list and who's not on their reading list. So I usually ask about a list of Nobel Prize winners, Ronald Coase, uh, Gary Becker, Friedman, they sometimes read. But then there was just a whole list of conservative Nobel Prize winners in economics that are not on the reading list in a lot of places. So there's the omission for it. So part of it, I think, conservatively inclined. By the way, you know, Wendy Brown at, at Berkeley, who's very left, she does assign Hayek on her reading list in political philosophy. But a lot of people don't. And well, so that is missing from the curriculum. That's a sign of the weakness of the people, the, uh, the unwillingness to have their ideas confronted by other ideas. And that, mm -hmm. you. You know, now that you could try to find in your reference checks, you could, you could try to do. But I, I, I just have a hard time seeing a position description that says we want somebody who will assign the following people on their reading list and their in their syllabi. That's dangerous. Well, I well. Don't want to go on too long. I actually am keeping an informal catalog that I'd like to formalize at some point that looks at job ads in political science. And the ones that are by departments where you have a high conservative quotient are very neutral in their language. You want someone who does public law, constitution, political theory, and you know, the other general language. Then there's a lot. So we want someone who can teach American politics, public law, from the perspective of race, class, and gender. No conservative is going to get that job, full stop. True? Probably not, although I, I'm not sure. I, I have, by the way, there is, I've looked yep. around, there is one conservative uh, taking a graduate degree in gender studies, and it turns out to be a peculiar story, but I've looked around, I'm thinking maybe yeah. it would be somewhere, right? Oh, I, well, one. Yeah, well, <laughs> check. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure these statistics are always meaningful, but I don't uh, have Well, that's why I'm going to try and add them up. And I think statistics. that's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, 
real. I mean, I, we do see the like the chair conservative. We've seen seen uh, chair conservative thought, which I think is is quite unique. Uh, we've seen conservatives call for the creation of an of an ivory tower of our own. Mm. Um, but beyond these kinds of uh, particular, uh, either a university, all of conservatives, and however that could be defined, I think that would be challenging. Or or chairs. What are the other things that that college leaders, whether they're presidents or chancellors, I mean, in theory the buck stops with the Board of Regents or faculty members, what are the things that can be done in college campuses? In addition to the things that we've spoken about already to bring in speakers, is it increasing the, the encouraging people to study history? Is it, uh, what are the other things we well, can do? Well, of course do? we should encourage people yeah. to and general education programs should make sure that history and, hmm. and literature and the sciences are all studied at, at some early stage. I feel I was not required to study as much science in college as, as I should have been, mm -hmm. and I have sort of regretted that for the, my whole life. It's a little late, but um, I, think, I think yes. I think people should be encouraged to study broadly across the curriculum, and I think uh, I think colleges and universities should hire people with a record of engaging in debate, with a record of, of, of being interested in, in other points of view. Um, I, I definitely think that's true. Mm -hmm. um, Eric, I have, I have one sure. little thing I, I wanted to raise with you, if Jackie will permit mm -hmm. it. Um, there are bills making their way around state legislatures mm. which, are, which say that uh, state employees may not advocate for boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel. And our, Texas is one, Kansas is another, Arizona is another. They're, they're various places. We're, we're keeping track of them on the, on the free speech project, on, on our free speech tracker. Um, I don't understand what's accomplished by doing that, except to make a lot of people angry and get some people fired because of their political views. Yeah. Uh, so I, first of all, I'm not an expert on the, on the legislative, on, the, on those particular pieces of legislation. I have to say, and maybe you are more expert than I, but I have to say with respect, I don't understand them the same way you just described them. Certainly they have nothing to do with advocating or with free speech or positions. It has to do with public institutions using their uh, purchasing power, their contracting power, to uh, engage with or with uh, 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 entities that are uh, that are supporting the boycotting uh, and divestment uh, movement, but uh, I, I think we I think we probably would would best leave that for another day. I, I want to be really clear that there's nothing Hillel and I personally support the free speech on campus 100 percent. Good. Mm -hmm. We have never ever tried to stop someone from speaking on campus, tried to uh, indicate that it's inappropriate to bring any particular uh, speaker on campus. I referenced the issue of freedom of association because we have said sometimes that we don't choose to participate in a particular speaker or program, or we don't choose to host a particular speaker or program, which, is I, which, which I believe you all agree with isn't always how it's received. Uh, I agree with that too. Uh, on, uh, on campus when we, when we take that position. Uh, but uh, our answer is the classic answer, which is more speech and better and, uh, and more comprehensive speech. Um, I would say, if I can uh, uh, shift to, uh, and as I said, I, we, 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 I, I promise you a better, a better response to the legislation, except to say that, that I know the free speech experts have looked at this quite closely to make sure that it's not uh, that it's not a free speech issue. But federal on the, courts on, on have the, said it is in uh, uh, several uh, states. Well, we also have federal legislation, so we'll, 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 yes, let, we we'll, we'll, let, we'll let the courts, we'll let the courts decide it. I, I, think, the, I, I think the answer that, that I would add to Jackie's question is, um, you know, we, most of this conversation has been about faculty and professors. Um, and once again, we respect academic freedom and respect academic expression. Uh, we understand how faculties are chosen. Um, however, the university is an ecosystem that is a climate at which students are intellectually uh, meant to be intellectually engaged and emotionally engaged um, in, uh, in developing their own ideas and their own 
and, and their own ability to express themselves. And as we all know, uh, a huge amount of that student development occurs not just in the classroom, uh, but occurs in the entire climate uh, of the campus. After all, you know, if, if we didn't care about campus life, we could, uh, you know, we could learn online and, uh, you know, and have all of our universities, have, have all of our universities online. Many people do, uh, but we still have places like Goucher College for a reason, right? Because there's, and you invest in student life, uh, you invested you at, yeah. in student life for a reason. Um, and, uh, and so what I wanted to suggest to you, Jackie, and to this, uh, this project as it begins to unfold, is that there's an entire part of the university um, that is, uh, that is uh, responsible for, the, for portions of that campus life and responsible for portions of that student experience. I mentioned them, some of them earlier, uh, student affairs and diversity offices and chaplaincies and, and a whole variety of institutions that are as much a part of the daily life of students as is their, uh, as is their interaction with particular, uh, particular faculty members. Um, and, uh, and, and I just would be not doing my job as a member of this panel if I didn't uh, urge this project as it launches to look at uh, the <coughs> challenges um, that students who hold differing opinions uh, or as a result, either as a result of their faith traditions or a result of their political, uh, or their political ideology are experiencing when that opinion is a relative minority opinion on campus. It is exacerbated, to be sure, when the comprehensive opinion of the faculty with whom they're engaged is all also uh, opposed to their, um, you know, to their uh, position. But, but this, is, this is an issue that is, uh, that is worthy of attention. Uh, I see it every day in students who are finding themselves challenged to raise their, uh, to raise their voices. And as we said, I, f I see them also being excluded from activities on campus as a result. And we're going to have to turn to the president's executive order in a minute, and I want to let Sandy respond first. Well, but I, I, want to, I want to add, when, it seems like one of the parts of the conversation is to whom does free speech really attach? Is it the students? Is it the university body as a whole? Is it groups within? But Sandy, please. Well, f first, I just, I just want to urge us to avoid generalizing about the situation mm. on all campuses yes. because there are some things that stand out. But we're, we're really down in the weeds in my project. And as many of you know, there was an emblematic, uh, horrific event at Middlebury College just about two years ago in Vermont where Charles Murray was prevented from speaking, a faculty member was physically injured. I mean, it was, it was the nightmare scenario on, in this beautiful little college campus in Vermont. Well, it turns out on that same night, the very same night, at Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, there was a speaker who was considered controversial by some people. I would not have considered him necessarily controversial. There were people who were protesting. They had, they got together, they had a conversation, the speech went ahead, they had discussions afterwards. And so it is possible, we're, we're developing curriculum models now on free speech in, in my project, and, and one of them is about the events in Middlebury and comparing it to, to other places mm -hmm. where things, so it doesn't, it doesn't always happen, and that was a, a matter of leadership, of people not, uh, see, I think one of the problems is that the, one of the lessons going out to students is that they have to declare themselves as being on one side or the other. Are you a liberal or are you a conservative? Well, you know, most people, most, certainly most college students who arrive, they come with all these different backgrounds. They, they may have as many different interpretations of free speech as, as we can think of. And that, it, it, it's not meaningful to them to have to declare themselves as one thing or another. They should be able to have conversations about issues and not have taboo opinions, a list of opinions they can't express or opinions they must express. And I think part of the problem, what, what has given some people on the right a bad name about this whole issue is this notion that somehow uh, people should not be should have to be willing to engage subjects like white supremacy. Richard Spencer, the, we, we all know who he is. And, mm -hmm. um, that if he comes and talks about his vision of America, which has a remarkable similarity, he would admit to a certain failed ideology in Europe from, from the 20th century. 
I, I think we've settled the issue of white supremacy in this country. I'm not sure how much character building we have to do <clears throat> by requiring people to weigh the merits of white supremacy. I, I, I think we know what the answer is. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's a, I think there's a if, if there's any topic around which there's a kind of national consensus, it's that that is a road we don't want to take and that leads to some very bad things. So this notion that people are snowflakes because they don't want to attend a conversation about white supremacy or don't want to be confronted by it, I think is, is an unrealistic thing. I don't, I don't think we need to, hit. that doesn't mean that Richard Spencer doesn't have a free speech right, he does. Mm -hmm. He has an absolute right to make a total fool of himself and to do it at every university that will let him come and do it. Mm -hmm. He has found, interestingly, that fewer and fewer people are turning up to protest him because they think he's just a, a, a freak. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so I think that um, we have to be practical and use common sense about some of this. Rather than fighting for the right of Richard Spencer to speak about white supremacy or some, some other people, Let's talk about real intellectual dialogue mm -hmm. on issues that are before us and that are important. Eric is pointing to several of them, so is Steve. That's what we need to do. I, that all sounds so uh, you know, exactly right. And I thought about President Obama speaking just a mile from here in his uh, 2016 uh, convocation remarks, saying that the, the way in which we hold people with the most objectionable views accountable is we let them speak. Yes. But I want to. I feel like I have to uh, today give some time to the president's executive order before we open things up for uh, questions and questions and answers and some final questions from me. Is the president's executive order going to be helpful in the problems and issues that we've talked about so far today? Absolutely not. And in my opinion. Damn, I'm going to have to almost agree with Sandy here. It really pains me to do. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a, a character-building experience. Yeah, it's, well, <laughs> it's a bit of a sideshow, I think, because uh, as I already hinted, I think that the issue of free speech is just one sort of small aspect of this, and it's a, well, let me do it two ways. I think it's a bad place for conservatives to be because what is the, I'll generalize here, but I don't, I don't think you'll object too much. No. A lot of the basic complaints of the left of a conservative speaker is you're racist, sexist, homophobe, Islamophobic. What have I left out? And so the conservative's answer is, but free speech? Really? We're going to say free speech to be racist, sexist, homophobic, Islamophobic? I don't, really I don't think that that ideology is surviving very much on you, well, campuses. Well, there but that's, will always that's, be people who say that. But that'll be the charge about, never mind Milo, it's a charge of, made of Ben Shapiro when he came to Berkeley, right? Who was none of those things, right? Okay. Um, the, the more narrower issue of, uh, um, I'm going to be watching this with some interest to see whether administrations that, for the most part, I think, uh, embraced the Title IX guidance from the Obama administration uh, will uh, implement... Um, and part of it is, by the way, Berkeley is actually serious about wanting to protect free speech. I've heard Chancellor Chris say, if someone wants to have Milo come, I will try to make it possible for Milo to come. I don't like the guy, it's set fine. Uh, but they actually want to do the right thing. They really were embarrassed by, they were unprepared for what the Milo episode, they lost control of the campus. That's why they were determined to make sure the Ben Shapiro event went forward. Right, right. right? I give huge props to I Carol think Chris for that. I she is a great defender. Of I do too. Um, and and uh, so, Berkeley has this reputation, but they're actually one of the good actors in all this. So I think this executive order, even though I mentioned Berkeley and President Trump brought up the kid who was beat up on Sproul Plaza, who was not a Berkeley student. Not a student, not attacked by students, right. arrested. Exactly. Right. The, right. the attackers were arrested. He didn't mention all that. He right. said it happened at Berkeley. Right, of course. And that's all you need, right? Because that's. Uh, so I, I think it's a sideshow. I'll stop there. Yeah. I, I think this is probably something we're going to agree on, and maybe, and maybe we can dismiss relatively quickly. I, I do at least have the sense that it's aimed at the, the circus acts or whatever Stanford your, yeah. your, uh, your, your, your phrase was. And, uh, and I agree that those things are really not the core of the issue 
that, that we're addressing today or that I hope this project is, gonna, is going to seriously tackle, uh, because as I've indicated, I think there are some serious issues to be, to be tackled. Um, I, I'll also add one other thing, which is, you know, I was the chancellor of a public university system. I love universities of all kinds, but I particularly love public universities. I spent a, probably 80% of my job was to advocate for more public funds uh, for, <laughs> for higher education, maybe 90%. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and there's, uh, to me, to, uh, I, I don't wish to threaten in any way or indicate in any way that the public support of, of higher education in this country, which has grown and continues to grow, not just in research, but in financial aid and all the, all the various areas, is one of, the, you know, one of the things about our civic society about which we should be most proud. Um, and uh, and should be supportive and shouldn't call into question. So that's why I'm. That's why I don't. Well, uh, you know, I'm not happy. And the notion that the federal government should step in and be supervising or requiring, I, I one can easily, having been in, in some of these jobs, one can imagine what's next: the establishment of an office someplace uh -huh. <laughs> to monitor compliance yeah, right. with equal. Yeah access to different opinions on college campuses. Mm -hmm. That just, and, and from someone who purports to be a conservative president or a, a president who wants to reduce regulation, reduce the mm -hmm. influence of the federal government, it's just absurd. And it won't work. It can't work. Mm -hmm. There's, who's going to decide? Who's going to set the standards? Uh, president Trump at four in the morning? <laughs> there, and also, look, I'm talking to presidents and, and faculty members, former, uh, I mean, this is obviously a, a huge marketplace for higher education. It's a competitive marketplace, mm -hmm. as you well knew, as, uh, as, as President Goucher. Um, and the marketplace also is going to have something to say about that. Look, we saw that at Missouri after the, uh, you know, after the incidents at Missouri. Oh, we saw a huge drop in, in student enrollment. Um, it certainly is possible that uh, these other issues, if uh, you know, if they are, uh, if some of the things I'm observing are as serious as I think they are, they'll long term, you know, will express themselves in student choices and student preferences, and um, and that's another way, the, another aspect of this that we should that we should address. Well, I think this notion that that some definition of free speech that we will never arrive at is tied to federal research funding is really insidious. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at, at, mm. at the extreme, this could be a, a terrible disruption of, of scientific research that is in the public interest that, it, that nobody would challenge. You know, the uh, observation on this, the, the threat to withdraw public funding for education has been made for a lot of things for a long time, oh, and sure. it's never happened. No. And I think as a practical matter, I, I agree with you on the principle of it as bad. As a practical matter, I don't think it ever will happen. Although it is interesting that, you know, what, it was two, three years ago now, we had 22 professors at Harvard Law School saying, the Title IX rules violate fundamental due process. Yeah. But why is everybody surprised that law professors at Harvard Law School express their opinions and they're not predictable? Not That's a wonderful <laughs> thing. Ah, but it's, it's the sequel, which was they were, they were saying, uh, look, it's, you know, uh, oh, what happened was, it's, uh, what Alan Dershowitz tells me is, I just saw him a couple weeks ago, is the administration called down to him and says, look, you guys at Harvard Law don't need many federal funds but Harvard Medical School does. We cannot do without the federal funds for Harvard Medical School, so I don't care what you guys think. We've got to keep going with what we have. Hmm. And I, mean, if, if I don't know. I think their bluff should be called yeah. on any one of these things. I don't think the uproar in Congress uh, would be enormous if the, if the federal government actually tried to cut off federal funds to a public university, well, I think. It, yeah. it should be. Yeah. Right. The uproar it's, everywhere it's, should it's, be it's, enormous. Or you were in a state. Yeah, yeah no, I, no, I, not at all. I just want to add that. Uh, so I, I, I made my, uh, my pitch for everybody funding public uh, universities yeah. to the greatest possible extent. It's, it's one of the proudest things of my career that I helped, uh, I helped encourage that. Uh, but the other reason I, I'm comfortable with that is that they're public universities. They have public governance. Uh, they are part of our, of our system of government. You know, uh, you mentioned uh, Berkeley. Obviously, this is a public university. And, and by the way, from the issues that I've raised here today, it's one of, it, actually, there's incredible intellectual diversity. The law school uh, at Berkeley is, is, an, is, is enormously active, yeah. many of the professors, yeah. uh, on one side of this issue, which, which provides an, an, an alternative point of view to the students who are, who are getting, yeah. a, it's really, it's extraordinary. But I mentioned another public university in California uh, today, which, by the way, Sanford, I'm sure you're following.
following. There was actually a lawsuit filed against San Francisco That's State. That's a notorious and there was, incident. And there was a, and not just about the it's incident involving the mayor that I described, but about the Hillel being excluded from uh, coalitions of student organizations because Zionists are welcome. The president of the university couldn't bring himself to actually say that Zionists are welcome on campus. Um, now, thankfully, the he's no longer the president. chancellor of uh, San Francisco State, or maybe uh, it's the uh, president. Uh, I'm sorry, whatever the title is. The person, San, San Francisco State, not State. of the state. Not, not of yeah, California, UC not system. of the yeah. not of the California state system of which right. San Francisco yeah. State is a part. The, the, to be very, clear. fortunately, he's no longer the president of that campus, the chancellor of that campus, whatever the correct title is. Um, but there was actually a lawsuit which was settled only in the last couple of weeks with a you know with a, an agreement um, that that was that's intended to encourage the university. Uh, to approach intellectual diversity, and so I think you know, look, the, 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 the leaders of those, the leaders of those uh, universities, the, the trustees are appointed by the governor. The, uh, as I recall, I think the speaker of the California House sits on uh, the, yep. the the board, and the and the president of the Senate likely something like that. They're, these are public institutions, um, and uh, and so the idea of intellectual diversity and the idea that all students, regardless of their identity, their beliefs, etc., should you know should should be able to engage openly in those universities, of which there have been too many examples to the contrary, is something that I think our political system can tackle and should tackle. It doesn't need to be tackled by threats of withholding of funds, but it should be tackled by, uh, by those who are, who are responsible for governing those institutions. So two, two quick comments. Oh, very quick. Very quick. One is, is that only people of a certain age will get this, but when it comes to San Francisco State, where is Sam Hayakawa when we need him? <laughs> second one, though, was more seriously. Second one, though, is you mentioned Ohio. The weird thing about California is the UC and state colleges have fared better in budgets under Republican governors than Democratic governors. This is one of those ironies that almost nobody this knows is about where? this. In Cal California. Uh. Um, now, that will change and can change if, uh, as we were saying at breakfast this morning privately, if there's a continuing partisan divide, it's, it's exam opening right now, between Republicans and Democrats and their attitudes towards universities. Republican legislatures, I think we may see a red state, blue state divide in public support for universities, and I think that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. The reasons for that irony are, are complicated, complex. but yeah. yeah. I mean, and broadly, the whole public support and, and confidence in the higher education yeah. system, public and private, I think it's, this, it's the, these free expression issues are at stake in that continuing to show that college and universities are really the stewards of that free and open debate. We, we, if President Trump really believed in free speech, in, in freedom for all speech, he would say, rather than issue this executive order, he would say please, to his supporters, please do not make death threats against people who criticize me mm -hmm. in public speeches. Yeah. Yeah. Because that does not help free speech. Yeah. I mean, and that takes us to the, the current climate. I don't want to limit it just to the current climate. But one of the things that we've been focused on in the panel is the student experience, what happens on campus, faculty and students. But I don't, and as a former college professor, I'm always thinking about the college experience. But one of the things that I, we're especially interested in here at the Bipartisan Policy Center is, is the civic society consequences of what we see on, on college campuses today. And I, I just want to ask each of you, you know, what, what does it mean for civil society when we have, even though there are many colleges and universities doing a good job of fostering free expression, there are also many places where we don't see that have it happening in as robust a way as we would like. Eric, I'll start with start with you this time. <laughs> um, well, I think I've uh, I, I probably have made my pitch for uh, uh, for at least the public institutions uh, being uh, you know essential parts of our civic society. Um, it, it's what drew me to them. I mean, I, I'm not an academic. I don't have a PhD. Uh, but as a member of the legislature in Ohio, I was drawn to higher education as, uh, you know, as the main uh, driver of future success of our citizenry. And that's why, you know, I supported it and eventually was, uh, you know, had the privilege of serving, uh, you know, in the office uh, of chancellor, essentially to be the champion of higher education. Look, I, I think you, you mentioned that uh, the, the funding of higher education yeah. 
uh, in, I think you said in California, California. Uh, you know, rose more under Republican governors than Democratic governors. So the study that I did, uh, you know, in Ohio is of, if you could control for recessions, which obviously affects mm. state yeah. revenues right. um, and, and can happen under either a Democratic or Republican governor, uh, the, uh, you know, the, actually the commitment to higher education was truly bipartisan. Um, and, uh, you know, in, uh, you could, uh, in Ohio, we had the famous Governor Rhodes, followed by the famous Governor Schles and others, and everybody added institutions. That's why we have so many institutions of higher mm -hmm. education. And every, if you have a two-year school, you want it to become a four-year school. And if you have a, a branch campus of a university, you want it to become, a, uh, you know, an independent, uh, independent university. There's an there's understanding of the role, uh, uh, you know, obviously the land grant and all of these, these uh, Incredible marks. These are actually, uh, you know, these really are the cornerstones of our civic society. So the the BPC believes it, and and, and I believe it. I believe everybody in this panel believes it. Which is why, which is why um, that uh, we do need to be uh, attentive uh, to uh, uh, to the the cases that exist uh, when we end up uh, in a situation where uh, you know where there really is a sort of an enforced uh, way of thinking uh, on any set of issues, um, and students feel oppressed, frankly, not snowflakes, but truly unable to, uh, to express fully um, their, uh, their identities. And we do know these instances exist. We shouldn't have to go to court like we did in, in California to, uh, you know, to seek to redress uh, those rights. We do operate within a system of, as I said, of, of government and civic life, which, which is, is, is vibrant on this. We, we have a, a, a advocacy life that we can all engage okay. in. And I'd like to think that the, that the academy and the faculty also, even if you hold one opinion uh, as a result of your research and your, um, you know, and your issues, also care to make sure that the other opinions uh, are heard for students and that the academy can take action as well. I'm not a member of the academy, so I'll have to leave it to those of you who are. But I'd like to think that would be a prior intellectual diversity should be a priority of the academy as well as of the uh, political sphere. Mm -hmm. Steve or Sandy? Well, I, I just think that uh, we all need to model the kind of civic conversation that we're having here, mm -hmm. and that uh, Steve and I might like to shout at each other, but we're not. <laughs> um, and I think that's just fine. It's less entertaining. <laughs> but, but um, I think I think students respond to that. I think mm -hmm. they see it. I hold these public forums at Georgetown now, as I did previously at other places, and we just—it's just a basic principle of it. We get a variety of different views. In public. we're doing something on the 16th of April on the free speech rights of incarcerated Americans. We're, one of our panelists is runs is a director of corrections. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's no need just to assemble everybody of the same point of view to shout and yell and agree with each other. We need to talk about security issues and, and how they play into free speech rights of prisoners and so on. And, and I think that can be modeled and people are so relieved when it happens, when, when there's a conversation like that and, there's not, and speakers aren't disrupted and, mm -hmm. and there's not that tension and that danger Inherent, and I hope that I hope Jackie, your project will be able to encourage that, and I'll work I'll work with you to try and do it. Thank you. Steve. So um, it's been interesting to go into the higher education world, as I say, as an inmate after having been in the think tank world here in Washington for such a long time, where the character of argument is like this. Often, not sharp enough, but sharp, but always sort of civil and serious. And by the way, you keep going, right? You don't leave the room so angry that That's you're right. never going to right. I sort of like it, and. That can be done on college campuses, but it's often hard, especially when you have students who are energetic and passionate as they should be. I guess um, I have a hard time figuring out exactly how to sort out how a college can be political in the right sense of the word and not politicized. And so sort of one, I have several thoughts, but one, I'll just give one. Um, I had this wonderful student a couple years ago when I first got there. He was very progressive, big Bernie bro. He's really <laughs> smart, he made the class great. And he signed up for my class. This is an interesting point. He says, uh, you know, I, I want to hear something different. 
because the Daily Cal had done a front page story on what a horrible human being I am coming to campus, which I welcomed. I wanted them to do that, actually. I planted that story. That's a good way to get students. Oh, I had long waiting lists, of course. And, and, and a lot of liberal students say, we want to hear something different, which ought to say something about market safety. There's but, a course on right? the history of conservative thought in America at Georgetown University. Right. Anyway, uh, this kid is uh, Solomon. He's really smart. But he's also very much of an activist, and so he's always going to Berkeley City Council meetings. He's got a petition for this. Straight A student, so you know he can do it. But so I did say to him, uh, and you know, I talked about you going to go to graduate school because you ought to, or law school, or something. He's clearly cut out for it. And I did say to him, and sort of general advice is, um, you know, you're good at all that. If you know, understand it. You, you're, you like it, makes you happy. But you really only get college for four years. And I, you know, I say to any student. You really are going to regret it if you don't maximize the resources and experience you have available to you here, because it's the only time you'll ever get it. And he sort of said, "Yeah, okay, you know, he does perfectly fine." But other, other I, anyway, I think that's one orientation I think that needs to be brought back mm -hmm. or brought to the fore. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and that's what professors should be doing. Yeah. I, I mean, I had I had great benefit from. Some of my favorite professors, both as an undergraduate and in graduate school, were actually pretty left. But they were really good. They never, never graded me down for any logical reasons. We'd have good we didn't have political arguments on current things in the classroom. We'd have it in the bar afterwards. But <laughs> that was how old were you? That was when the drinking well, age was really wasn't 35 uh, years ago now, right? <laughs> graduate school year. It's, yeah. Uh, well, I had, I had the advantage of uh, going to my undergraduate studies in Canada where the drinking age was 18. So you could really, <laughs> yeah. uh, get with your faculty members to the, to the pub afterwards. Well, I have so many more questions that I wanted to, to ask, but we are going to open it up now for question and answers. There'll be people bringing microphones. And when you uh, raise a question, please uh, state your name and your organizational affiliation and, um, and genuinely uh, do ask a question. So uh, microphones, uh, gentlemen here first. Hello, my name is Ken. I'm retired. Uh, my question is, so how does someone go about drawing the lines about what views, if any, or what articulation of views, if any, are outside acceptable bounds? I'm lynching of minorities, expressing uh, skepticism about the existence of God or ownership, state ownership of capital, or being an active Nazi, or advocating the lynching of minorities. Who draws those lines about who should be invited? And does the drawing of those lines depend on who is funding the speaker, whether it's an oh, outside geez. source Oof. or the institution itself? Well, I, I teach um, small undergraduate seminars on free speech at Harvard in the fall to first semester freshmen, at Georgetown in the spring to juniors and seniors. And that is, the, that is an issue that we struggle with all semester, each time, and we find there is no answer. It's very difficult to draw boundaries. And there are political contexts. There are violence. Anything that advocates violence, it seems to me, we are, we are on safe ground arguing against it. I mean, those people who went to Charlottesville in August of 2017 may have had a right to express their views. Uh, they do have a right to express their views. But when they bring weapons, when one of the notorious guys had, was carrying eight or nine different weapons on his body, I have a problem with that. I don't, I don't think that's just free speech. So that's literally weaponized, not just metaphorically weaponized when he does that. So I think we sometimes depend on, on moments on the firing line about when danger is raised, but it's very hard to draw boundaries. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 pick one example you gave is someone advocating lynching of minorities. I actually think that falls under the prescriptions of the law of harassment and incitement, where we have some fairly, they're not perfect, but we have some bright lines on some of that. Mm -hmm. I, I think the difficulty We've settled is, those questions, yep. as I said before. Yeah, the, the difficulty I find is, so you mentioned Richard Spencer. He came up one day at one of our big discussions before a packed house at Berkeley, and I said, look, uh, being a public university has to be open to all comers. Spencer won court cases for access to University of Florida, I think. He did. Mm -hmm. Right. So I said, so look, I mean, my attitude about this would be, this is, this is a, sort of a, there's a twist ending to this. I said, my attitude should be, <laughs> if you can't stop him from coming, um, first of all, let's uh, organize some support structures for students who are upset about it 
and you know, what's the counter argument to him, not actually, I want to be in the room, I want to be first at the microphone, and the outline of my argument is, you, sir, are anti-American, and as such, you are an illegal immigrant who should be deported. <laughs> now, what do you think the reaction to that was? The reaction was, I used the term illegal immigrant, even though I was using it ironically, the kind of language Spencer would use, and a whole lot of students reported afterwards how upset they were that I used the term illegal immigrant on the Berkeley campus, because you can't say it. You've got to say undocumented alien. It's the term of art, No, right? not alien. <laughs> not yeah. alien. And what is it, yeah. undocumented person? Undocumented I, immigrant, perhaps, but not I, alien. I'm behind, I'm okay, I'm behind. Alien behind. is, <laughs> a, right? but I don't think we should use the word alien, because that, you know, I think that, that well, I was thinking ET, point. but when someone says, okay. Right. So, so, the, so the, there's the problem. And I'll just give one more. Is, uh, I like to teach the Lincoln-Douglas debates in some classes. Lincoln and Douglas use the N-word very freely in certain places. And by the way, some of those passages I think are really important for understanding certain aspects of Lincoln's statecraft. Mm. I hesitate a long time. I don't read it aloud for certain. And I even hesitate to assign it these days. And I don't know. That's, um, I, I, I hate the try. I don't. I take no joy in highlighting that language that Lincoln used, but this is a problem. So the other thing I'll add quickly is, I, if I understood the context of the question, the responses had to do with speakers, um, and, uh, and I have nothing uh, to add to, to what uh, my colleagues have said. Uh, but uh, I think we do know that the most, among the most challenging issues that arise in higher education uh, is when there's a faculty member, whether tenured or not tenured, uh, who uh, appears to be beyond the lines of of what is academic uh, argument and into conspiratorial, uh, racist, uh, other language. We had a case at Oberlin, many of you know, uh, of a uh, uh, of uh, you know a blatant uh, dealing in conspiratorial, anti-Semitic, uh, you know, uh, language. Um, I have no. I actually knew some of the trustees of the university at the time, as well as the president. I have no doubt how challenging and difficult uh, that issue is everybody wanting to bend over backwards to make sure that we're not infringing on academic uh, freedom. But at a certain point, there is a line. Um, and in this case, they determined the line had been crossed. It's, it's a decision with which I when, agree. Um, but uh, it was, uh, it's, it, those cases do exist. When people go online and say outrageous things online, they're not expressing academic freedom any more than, than anybody is. It's, it's in the public forum, and it has to be judged by what harm or good it's doing to the public debate. Let's take another question. Uh, yes, in the, in the back. Uh, my name is Roger Cochetti. I work with uh, private equity in the technology sector. And it so happens that I was a student body president at Georgetown University in 1971, mm. the <laughs> peak of the anti-war period. And we were, no one would describe our approach to speech as tepid. Um, <laughs> demonstrations, sit-ins, right. lions, right. streaking, for those who are not old enough, streaking as somebody, taking off their clothes and right. running behind the speaker to ridicule them. But the, uh, the, the panel today introduced a new term, and I obviously admit I have not followed this subject closely. They introduced introduce a new term that I've never heard before, and I'm perplexed by it. Um, it, it, it. Not even the weathermen or the mad dog faction of the SDS would ever classify a speaker as a circus clown. Hmm. If General Westmoreland wanted to come and speak, if George Lincoln Rockwell, who was the real Nazi, by the way, not a fake one. Who did was speak the, a lot in the 60s on campuses, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so the, the, these... If they wanted to come to campus and speak, they were taken deadly seriously. They were not circus clowns. Yeah. You, many people felt they had the right to use violence or kill them, but no one, I've never heard the concept before, <laughs> that kill them. classify somebody as a circus clown, and once they're classified as a circus clown, then they don't have the right to speak. I it. never said anyone well, doesn't yeah. have the right to speak. Then, yeah. then let, me, let me ask my question, and you can, you can answer it, which is, because it sounds a little bit to me like a George Or Orwell on person. If mm. somebody, what is a circus clown? Who decides who is a circus clown? All the panelists reference this. Who decides who is a circus clown? And if you are classified as a circus clown, is there any appeal? Can you become a non-circus <laughs> clown? And, and uh, w w w you know, so what, what is this category of circus clown? I, I've never heard it before. Thank you. Well, my only, the only thing I have to apologize for is that I may have insulted the great circus clowns <laughs> of, of history who were great performers. 
I, I use the term to explain why some speakers are simply seen now as not so desirable. There are a couple, and, and I think Steve and I more or less agree on the category of Sadly, people. Sadly, yes. Yes. Um, on the category of people who come and are not contributing to intellectual dialogue, but merely disrupting and causing. I have not said, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty careful about this, I wouldn't say because I don't believe that there should be a category of people who are prevented from speaking. I, I, I don't believe that. Um, but there are just people, the de what I was trying to say is that the debate often centers around some of these characters who are not contributing to intellectual dialogue, but are behaving in a manner that cre contributes to disruption, often to violence, to security threats, and, and I, are therefore not to be taken particularly seriously. But if people want to invite them, I, I, I'm, you know, I think they're learning not to because they don't advance dialogue and they just have physical damages as a result. And real cost, too. I think some, it was something like $3.7 million to bring Milo the second time. Oh, it's time. crazy. And so that's yeah. every dollar one spends on security for someone who is a provocateur of security. You can hold yeah. sensible panel discussions for a whole lot less than that. <laughs> uh, yes, um, young lady in the black. Hi, good morning. My name is Beatrice Wayne. I work at University of Maryland at the Business School. I am one of the staff members at the Center for uh, Markets and Enterprise. Yeah. And my question to you is pretty much in terms of we haven't discussed too much about the students that don't identify themselves as liberal or conservatives, which is a, a pretty wide population. Yeah. These students mm -hmm. are kept silent, and that's my worry. My worry is not about the ones that really identify themselves as one or the other, but it's all of those kids that haven't developed yet their strong character or they have discovered exactly where do they want to be. And those are the ones that are just kept silent. And I think that that's my fear about having a generation of students that will be so fearful of speaking up or just telling the truth because they're going to be either, you know, pretty much criticized or even threatened physically about just saying exactly what they feel and what they say. So I would love to hear your thoughts about what you will tell to our students that are pretty much in the middle, that don't identify themselves as one or the other, to really speak up and, and pretty much practice their exercise to free speech. You go. So yeah, I'm not quite sure. The sort of students in the middle, that can take in a broad range of different types. I think an awful lot of students, uh, th these are ones who are mostly a lot of them are, I hate to overgeneralize, a lot of them are in college to get a degree for the practical reasons they want to get a good job and have a profession. Uh, you'll hear some such students say, well, I took one political science class or one literature class and that was enough. Because they either didn't care for the material, didn't interest them, or in some cases it's because of the particular approach that is often politicized and puts them off. Uh, interesting finding two, three years ago from the, the folks at UCLA, I think that's where the Higher Education Research Institute is, and they do these surveys. It's a curious thing. They found, and I wish there's more follow-up on this, that liberal students and conservative students tended to get higher grade point averages than mo so-called moderates or people of no ideology. And I, I, I want to know more about that. I'm not satisfied with that top Very line numbers we say in surveys. Where was that done? I think it was the Higher Education Research Institute. People uh -huh. do all those big surveys, right? right. I think it was them. I, gotta go, I read this three, four years ago but, now. And anyway, I, I sort of wonder if that's true, and that's sort of meaningful in the way a survey should be. I wonder if that's because of a certain commitment to an ideology just makes you, you know, more curious, work harder, even if it's along one track. I'm not sure. Uh, um, but I'm very curious about that. And yeah, it's the students in the middle. I mean, I don't know, you can't tell about students, because a lot of them, I mean, I've had some big classes, and I, I have no idea what the students might think, because they don't tell me. And it's, by the way, I don't ask That's them, I should, fine. right? <laughs> exactly, I can totally agree with all that, right? And so the, I'll have ones on the left, on the right, tell me what they think, and that's great. Uh, it's the ones in the middle, yeah, I don't know what to make of that. Uh, I, I have two reactions to your question, if I may. One is you imply that somebody is keeping them, they're kept from expressing their opinions. I don't understand who that is. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of anyone. Sometimes you see self-censoring. Well, they may self-censor yeah. yeah. themselves. Fear of, you know, their, whatever they say going viral and then pretty much getting back mm. to them in the future mm. for job purposes yeah. or whatever it is. But that's pretty much what I'm seeing in the classroom. 
Well, oh. I'm kind of against cell phone videos just in general for that reason. A footnote about that, especially at smaller liberal arts colleges where the classes are 15, 20, 25 students, a lot of students will tell you, it can be any kind, that their biggest fear these days is not the professor who may disagree with them or maybe thought might grade them harshly, but it's other students get on social media and say, you know, someone said something awful in class. And Steve, I don't doubt that that's happened in some yeah. places, but my lived experience running a college, working at colleges, working at American University before that, working at Harvard and Georgetown is that that is, I think that is quite rare. I really do, my, in my experience. The other thing I want to say is I would encourage modern people who don't declare themselves as one or the other is stay right where you are. There's no need. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't have to be one or the don't other. Don't have to choose teams. No. Yeah. You don't have to be on the blue team or the green team right. of the color war. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's just fine. The, the, only, the only thing I'll add to this is, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I've put challenges to the universities today. Uh, I don't actually think this is one that is comprehensively about the university. I do think, though, it's about teaching and pedagogy and education in general. Uh, you know, our work is about trying to draw out students who aren't engaged uh, every day. And so we spend a lot of time uh, studying and thinking about and talking to the best educators about how, how we do that. I'm sure you work hard on your pedagogy as a teacher, you know, in, in your teaching mode at the University of Maryland. Um, and uh, and this, is, this is one of the, uh, one of the challenges. We know that when an issue is highly politicized uh, and there are people on both sides that are, you know, going at it like crazy, uh, you know, the, the others shrink from, from jumping in. It happens at my dinner table. You know, my son, <laughs> one, of my, one of my sons starts yelling about something and my other son, you know, just wants to shrink away and go, you know, go shoot hoops or something. So the, yeah. um, so we, it is about, uh, it is about uh, you know, drawing people in and challenging them and helping control, you know, the classroom in such a way that everybody feels that they can participate. Another question, uh, yes. Thank you very much and thank you to all the panelists. Um, my name is Clarissa Unger. I'm the Director of Civic Engagement for an organization called Young Invincibles. Uh, through that, I lead a coalition called the Students Learn, Students Vote Coalition, of which about 400 nonprofits across the country participate in, including Hillel, who is a great partner of ours. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is that I think it's very important that we define both the landscape that we're talking about and also um, just the project itself and discuss that. Uh, in terms of the landscape, um, I think it's important to note that uh, half of the country's 20 million students attend community colleges, um, which has have not been a part of this conversation at all today, nor have students themselves. Um, Further, uh, I wonder, and I'd love to hear a reaction from the panelists on this as to um, the project is framed as a uh, project for free expression on campuses, but I'm wondering mostly, especially to Stanford, your point about is it really a crisis of free expression that we need to confront or a crisis of deliberative dialogue on campuses? Is the problem really that students don't know how to express themselves or that they don't know how to have deliberative dialogue with other folks on campuses that might have different intellectual views because it's not modeled in many places in our country like the way we are seeing it modeled here today. It's, it's not modeled in national politics at the moment, which is, which is really a shame. Um, but uh, I, I think you, you put your finger on a very important issue. I think there are some people who are reluctant to enter the dialogue, some students. And that can be for many reasons. That's not just because of political ideology. There are a lot of, I mean, first of all, your point about community colleges is such an important one. And I'm glad you were here to make it, that none of us did, because that's where a lot of people are getting their education. And, and beautifully so, no question about it. But um, a lot of people, you know, I had a student who said to me, uh, well, I'm told I should defend myself in these conversations. But I, I didn't grow up talking about these things at our dining room table. I grew up talking about my father's work as an auto mechanic and whether, whether we were, we were going to survive financially. And he came to college, and he didn't, he didn't know how to defend himself. He didn't know how to participate. So there, I think, is an issue which applies to community colleges as well, of trying to teach people in some very basic practical ways 
to enter the conversation, whatever conversation, and making it easier for them to do so. Um, leveling the playing field of who gets listened to, I think, is very important. You know, there, we, I've participated in the last couple of years in some conferences about the issue of free speech and inclusion, as if they are separate things. Our speech will get freer when inclusion is more successful. And I think it's that simple. They don't, we don't have to choose. Yeah, a quick comment about that. I didn't, didn't learn until I got to Berkeley that California's community college system, which has some excellent ones, actually is a very effective pipeline into the four-year universities, yes. including Berkeley. You know, Berkeley is almost as hard to get into as an Ivy League school as a freshman first year, whatever we're supposed to say now. Um, but it's pretty easy to transfer in if you have a good community college <coughs> record. And uh, an awful lot of them turn out to be Hispanics who are first generation of their family to be in college. I try to find this out without, you know, you're not supposed to ask some of these things these days, but I try and find out because I think it's interesting. Um, so it works very well in California. Um, and I'll stop there. Uh, I'll just, I want to endorse, because the, the other points have been endorsed. <laughs> I want to endorse the point about civil dialogue. And I just want to emphasize, and, and much in the way that I did to the previous question, this is a skill that requires training and intentionality. It is not easy to do. It's not. The, the natural human uh, you know, uh, instinct to know how to conduct and, and uh, model and, uh, and, and instigate and, and uh, moderate these kinds of conversations. Um, we have a, prog a project we call Ask Big Questions, you may be familiar with, which is about training students how to lead a discussion about big questions in life and how to listen because, of course, we all know when we're listening, we're already thinking about how we're going to respond instead of actually you know, reflectively listening. Um, and we are actually about to invest a significant amount in the professional development of our, of our professionals on the very issues that I've discussed here today, which is how, because we have differing opinions within our own community, of course, on these issues, uh, on how to uh, make a place welcoming to everybody and enable them to share their opinions with each other. So I, you know, Stanford much, much earlier talked about that some of the things universities could do. One was to bring other speakers with other points of view if they see it being, if, if they see the, the discourse of the campus being too one-sided. Another is to invest heavily uh, in the kind of training and pedagogical techniques that are necessary uh, to do this. A campus that really, that students are really uh, engaged in, in these kinds of uh, dialogue is the kind of place I want to send my uh, you know, kids to and I think will become a model. But it doesn't just happen. It happens with intentionality and, uh, and frankly, skill. Well, I know we're almost out of time today. And I, I love this uh, uh, idea of asking big questions, because that's what I know we're mm. going to be trying to do with the Campus Free Expression Project at, at BPC. It's a very complicated and nuanced uh, set of issues. And I appreciate our panelists so much for, for discussing them today. We're going to be engaging in a number of initiatives and, and visits to college campuses uh, beginning uh, next month. And we'll be bringing together a working group of policymakers and, and college leaders to try to help us think of thoughtful ways in which we can genuinely teach this very difficult skill to college students, uh, community college, uh, university students, so that when they graduate, we can have a more healthy civic discourse. So I want to thank all of our panelists so much very much. Uh, Sandy Unger, Steve Hayward, Eric Finkerhut, thank you very much. And I do want to thank all of you who came today very much. The first thing on a Monday morning, I do appreciate your spending time with us on this very important issue. So thank you all very much. <laughs>